Good evening. John chapter 8, verses 1 to 11, the story of the woman taken in adultery. This is a very famous and much loved story, and it's one of my favourites. However, it doesn't appear in the earliest manuscripts of John's Gospel. That shouldn't cause too much concern. At the end of the Gospel, the writer says himself that there were many other things that Jesus did. Perhaps this incident is one of them that only made it into a later version of the Gospel. Why do I like it so much? Well, it's a very well-drawn story, and it, it really corresponds to certain values, I suppose I would say, or things I really care about, and things which I would share with many another modern Western Christian, and, and I think we've probably got these ideas from the example and teaching of Jesus filtered down through the years. Because on the one hand, you have really a pretty unattractive bunch, a group of scribes and Pharisees, and one imagines bearded, probably slightly elderly men, who have caught this unfortunate woman in the very act of committing adultery. This speaks of a very sort of close-knit society where this is the kind of thing that you can easily caught, um, get caught doing. You might wonder what's happened to the man who was involved. He doesn't seem to have been brought along. Maybe they didn't consider that a, a man should be punished in this way, even though the law of Moses did specify that both the man and the woman were to be punished. The law did state that people taken in adultery or or accused of adultery and convicted on the witness of two or three people, should actually be stoned to death. And in order to test Jesus, the scribes and the Pharisees drag this unfortunate woman um, into the limelight and, and they say to Jesus, well, what do you think we should do? Should we stone her to death? And presumably they pick up stones to get started if Jesus is going to give them the go-ahead. To begin with, he ignores them and uh, in a very odd uh, bit of the story. John has him drawing in the in the ground, on the ground. doesn't say what he actually drew, what he actually wrote. And he does this twice. Eventually he says, well, um, if any of you is without sin themselves, they can cast the first stone. And then gradually they all melt away, presumably dropping their stones as they go. And then Jesus turns to the woman and, and, and asks her whether there's uh, anyone left to condemn her. And she says there isn't. And he says, well, I don't condemn you either. Um, off you go. And don't sin again. Well, there are various aspects to this story which somebody like me and modern Western Christian uh, find uh, particularly compelling. This is a, a depiction of a very patriarchal group, a perhaps rather misogynistic group, because they haven't bothered to try and catch the man, and we're going to feel very sympathetic towards the woman in this, in this predicament. And we know that there are cultures today, there are societies today, in which uh, women who commit adultery are at greater risk than men of being caught and, and sometimes even stoned to death in the 21st century. Uh, and this is a very great scandal and something that I think most of you listening to this talk, I hope all of you listening to this talk, would thoroughly condemn. And so we can present this story as one in which Jesus shows himself uh, to be very much um, in favour of, of not judging un unfortunate women like this who've been caught committing adultery in this terribly patriarchal society. And we can feel extremely comfortable that our own beliefs and our own values are being affirmed by Jesus. And uh, we can generally just feel very good about this story. But then I thought to myself, as I reflected on this, why was this reading set as one of the readings for this year's Ash Wednesday service. Because the whole point of, of Ash Wednesday and the beginning of Lent is that we're not supposed to feel comfortable about our values and, and read a story in which we can set ourselves on the side of Jesus and say, yeah, well, this is how we would have behaved. We, we wouldn't condemn somebody in this circumstance and these dreadful scribes and Pharisees being prepared to stone her to death are clearly the enemy. Because the whole point about Ash Wednesday and the beginning of Lent is we're supposed to be looking at what's wrong with us. We're supposed to be looking into our own hearts, examining our own consciences. And if I'm going to be challenged and, and, uh, and actually um, uh, caught by this story into looking more deeply into what's wrong with my life, 
Um, I don't really want to just be feeling comfortable about the fact that I'm ranged on Jesus' side in this dispute between him and the scribes and Pharisees. I think why the story has been chosen may be as follows, and, and, I, and I think it's a very good reason. I think the point is that all of us, or me anyway, I, I don't know about you, perhaps you, um, you share this weakness, all of us enjoy and, and appreciate the opportunity to criticise other people. It's, it's an extremely agreeable practice and if we're particularly bold we may even enjoy criticising and judging other people to their face. But really that's not the way to go about our lives. And, and yet it is, well, is it universal? I think it probably is a universal human characteristic. It is certainly something from which I derive enormous enjoyment and satisfaction. Though I have to say I'm not usually bold enough to judge and criticise people to their faces. I far prefer to do it behind their backs. But Ash Wednesday and Lent is probably a time when I should be considering whether this is actually the right way to go about my life. When Jesus says, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone, he could be taken as referring to any act of judgment, any criticism or condemnation of another person for what is wrong with their life. And by challenging these scribes and Pharisees to think about their own lives, he challenges them in such a way that they realise that they're not without sin, that they are in no better state than the woman they're about to stone to death. And so they melt away one by one. And I don't think really the story is so much about the woman as about the scribes and Pharisees. We can sympathise with the woman. Yes, OK, cheating on your partner, breaking the sacred marriage bond is not a good thing to do, but it's one that in all sorts of circumstances, particularly in a society where marriages were perhaps arranged and uh, weren't based on love matches, it's the kind of thing that no doubt people were tempted to do in all sorts of circumstances. We shouldn't really speculate about what this woman's circumstances uh, actually were, though plenty of writers haven't hesitated to do so. But we can empathise with her because this is a situation in which anybody might easily find themselves unless they're particularly virtuous. But it's actually the scribes and the Pharisees that learn a very important lesson from this encounter. And I suspect they go away improved as a result of the encounter because they realise that they are in no position to judge. And in fact, they would be better spending their time looking into their own hearts and their own souls and working out what is wrong with their own lives. And time is a crucial factor here because time is quite short. We don't know when our lives are going to come to an end. And as we get older, we see the end approaching ever more rapidly in our subjective consciousness. And it seems to me that the time that we spend criticising other people and telling them how they can shape up and change their lives and generally passing judgment is time we are not spending on looking into our own hearts and souls and wondering how we can improve our own lives, how we can judge ourselves and find ourselves wanting and look for ways in which we can improve. And if there's one discipline that I'm going to try and impose on myself this Lent, it is as follows. That the time that I would normally spend in the enjoyable contemplation of other people's inadequacies and weaknesses, and occasionally when I feel bold enough pointing them out to them, that time I'm going to try and spend in actually investigating how I can improve my own life, my own behaviour, my own dispositions and my own attitudes. And I think if people were able to do this, if I am able to do this, then I might say to myself, well, when I'm good and ready, when I think I've actually got myself sorted into a perfectly virtuous disposition, only then will I start criticising and condemning other people. And I might find that that point, that moment, never actually comes. But wouldn't it be a good thing if I come to the end of my life, having spent all the available time in which I could have been condemning and criticising and judging other people, actually looking into my own heart and trying to live a little better, trying to improve those areas of my life 
where there are weaknesses, where there are in inadequacies, where there are things that I could criticise. And even though I don't think I'm probably going to manage it, I think if you do consider somebody who does actually manage to do this, to spend the time in which they might otherwise be criticising and judging others, actually judging and improving themselves, I think by the time they get to their, the end of their lives, they will have achieved a light of real holiness. And if any of us are actually prepared properly to meet God when we reach the end of our, our lives, I think people who have managed that level of replacing criticism of others with a proper self-examination will, will be people who have reached something very like the holiness to which we are all, not just Christians, I believe, called by the God who gave us life.